in our family, if you don't know this, um, our son Gray was born with a, um, some different birth anomalies really that made it necessary and has made it necessary for him to undergo um, different kind of corrective surgeries. And so um, it was in 2017 that we found ourselves on the cusp um, of another surgery. I think it was actually his 10th if I count correctly. And some of these surgeries were big surgeries and some of them were really small surgeries, but this one in particular was one of the biggest. He was going to have a long recovery period, about six weeks, um, in which he was going to have to have like limited, really limited movement. Um, he was going to have quite a bit of pain, to be honest, and a really strict diet. And so he was nine years old. A really limited mobility uh, was a challenge for us. We were trying to figure out what to do because all he really wants to do is play basketball. But what he had to do was lay on the couch. And if we didn't want him just like vegging out in front of television, and, and video games all day, which he did a lot of, we had to get creative. You see, he's not uh, much of a crafter, you would say. And so um, one of the things we started to do together was to read. And we'd done that when he was smaller, but we started to read um, some different chapter books together. And I had the idea to read um, the book Wonder. It's by an author, her name is R.J. Palacio. And she writes the story of a boy called August, um, who actually had some of the same challenges that Graydon had when he was born. Not all the same, but some. And so I thought, oh man, this should be a good book. Plus it came highly recommended by my daughter, Camille. She had read it a few years earlier and had gone on and on about how great it was, um, that it was actually just like our family, super relatable. There was a mom and a dad, an older sister. Her name was Via. And of course the younger brother, August, and they had a really poorly behaved dog called Daisy. And so I should read this book. She had said this before the movie was about to come out. So I thought, Perfect. We're going to read Wonder together. And so um, the book is written in a way that each character has different sections and it's written from their perspective. So August, the younger brother, would write, you know, we would read what he was experiencing and feeling and doing. And then we would read Via, the older sister's perspective. And so I'm going to read you a portion and I want you to try and imagine what I was feeling as I was reading it the first time to my son, Graydon. It started like this. August, that's the younger brother, August is the son. Me, Via, me and mom and dad are planets orbiting the sun. The rest of our family and friends are asteroids and comets floating around the planets orbiting the sun. I'm used to the way the universe works. I've never minded it because it's all I've ever known. I've always understood that August is special. And if I was playing too loudly and he was trying to take a nap, I knew I would have to play something else because he needed his rest after some procedure or other had left him weak and in pain. Mom and dad would always say that I was the most understanding little girl in the world. I don't know about that. I just understood that there was no point in complaining. I've seen August after his surgeries. And after you've seen someone else going through that, it feels kind of crazy to complain over not getting the toy you had asked for. I knew this even when I was six years old. No one ever had to tell me it. I just knew it. So I've gotten used to not complaining and I've gotten used to not bothering mom and dad with little stuff. I've gotten used to figuring things out on my own. When mom or dad asked me how things are going in school, I've always said good even when it hasn't always been so good. My worst day, worst fall, worst headache, worst bruise, worst cramp, worst mean thing anyone could say has always been nothing compared to what August has had to go through. This isn't me being noble, by the way, it's just the way I know it is. And this is the way it's always been for me, for the little universe of us. As I read this chapter aloud to Graydon, can you imagine how hard it was for me to get through it? I was struggling to hold back tears and my mind was racing like I was saying the words, but my mind was going through like this, this Via is who Camille identifies with? <laughs> Our daughter? Maybe I'd heard her wrong. <laughs> she feels alone and overlooked and that she can't share things with me? It made me really emotional and then I was sad but then I was also defensive like are you kidding me right now? I was angry. 
And I was sad. You know, when Camille got home from school that day, I was trying to act cool and be good about it. And I was making dinner and I casually kind of brought up the book and that we were finally reading it together. And she was so stoked. I asked her about it and she said, oh man, I love that book. And I especially love Via. It's like she gets me. Why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you it because I'm here to talk to you about parenting and healthy relationships. And I do that really gently and carefully. I do that. I tell you this because I don't want you to think, I think we've gotten it all right because we haven't. I am no expert. I have messed up plenty. I have yelled. I've said things I shouldn't have said. I have flown off the handle. My husband and I are not like super structured people. So we've been super inconsistent at times and then really consistent at other times, which only proves our inconsistencies. Um, I know that parenting is hard and I know that you want to get it right. Man, so do I. <laughs> but I'm not going to be able to give you a formula or a step-by-step -step plan today. There isn't a guarantee that if you do A plus B, you will get C and have this like perfect, awesome relationship with your kids when they're older. Um, I just can't do that, but I can come here and share with you a little bit of the stuff that I've learned. Um, I can encourage you in whatever stage that you're at in your parenting journey. And I'm also hopeful that you'll leave here today with maybe an idea or a next step that you can do um, to better your relationship with your kids, whatever age and stage they're at. Oh, and if you are someone without kids, this matters to you too. The truth is we've either been parented or we are a parent. That's part of it. But on top of it, we are actually all a part of a community together, all a part of that rich soil that we've been speaking about for the last few weeks. Um, many of you have the opportunity, the privilege, and actually the responsibility to help us, those of us who are parents, in the raising of our kids. Did you know that studies have shown that if a child has at least one adult outside of their parents who are interested in them, who they have a relationship with, um, who care for them in some way. Um, if they have at least one adult who does that, they are more likely to finish high school. They are more likely to have healthy friendships and marriages. They are less likely to commit suicide and they are more likely to say no to drugs or alcohol. Isn't that amazing? So this matters to you guys too. You are a part of um, this like beautiful weaving of community that we get to raise up kids together in. So please don't tune me out. We need you. Us parents, we need you. Um, and so I hope that you'll listen. So if parenting is hard and we want to get it right, where do we begin? And I actually think we need to begin with what the it is that we're trying to get right. Like what is the it? Sometimes we think it's like a list of our dreams and goals that we have for our kids. But the truth is, whether they get married or not, what job they have, whether they make us grandparents, whether they choose to follow Jesus is actually their own choice and not actually a good uh, representation or diagnosis of our effectiveness as parents. In Andy and uh, Sandra Stanley, so Andy Stanley is a pastor um, out of Atlanta. Um, him and his wife recently wrote a book. It's called Parenting, Getting It Right. Um, and he talks about determining what the it is actually helps to inform all the ups and downs that we experience as parents taking our little cute little babies into adulthood. There are lots of practical tips and ideas for what to do. And we're going to cover a little bit of that too. But really what they write is that after decades Decades of parenting, we are convinced more than ever that the win for parents is healthy adult relationships with their children and healthy adult relationships between siblings. In other words, kids who enjoy being with their parents and with each other when they no longer have to be. They go on to say that a healthy parent-child relationship is the best predictor of a child's relational success outside of the family. <sighs> So if that's true, and because we're in a sermon series that's talking about healthy relationships, we're gonna spend the majority of our time today talking about how we can parent our children with the relationship in mind. 
Now, when we think about this daunting task, it's hard to know where to start. How do we start developing a rich soil of healthy relationship with our kids? And as people who follow Jesus, we're desperate to know what God has to say about it, aren't we? Um, in fact, we're so desperate sometimes that we will approach the Bible as an instruction manual instead of what it really is, which is a collection of books that points us to the redemptive love of God through, the, through um, His Son, Jesus. And so when we, even though the Bible has lots of things to say about healthy relationships um, that can be applied to marriages and friendships and parenting, um, there isn't a lot of like direct instruction on how to parent. And so when we try to create one from the snippets of it, we can get ourselves into trouble. It's kind of like the analogy that we've been referring to over the last few weeks about um, having rich soil and growing our relationships out of it. It's actually um, based on an analogy Jesus spoke about in the New Testament, but he was using it in regards to like the soil of our heart that cultivates spiritual growth. He was talking about how we grow in relationship with him, but it also makes sense when we talk about growing our own relationships. And so we take passages from scripture and we apply it into the day-to-day -day workings of our lives. Um, one of the things that this analogy has given us is words like, um, yeah, we want rich soil, but the, the enemies of that are weeds and shallowness and hardness. And so when we think about that in light of parenting, and if our goal is to have a healthy relationship with our kids, how do we deal with the weeds? How do we deal with the shallowness? How do we combat hardness in the soil that in inevitably creeps in? So let's begin by talking about the weeds. Because weeds are inevitable, aren't they? I mean, if you've ever tried to grow a garden, I try every year, I have this romantic idea about gardens and then I realize I don't like dirt and I don't like actually doing it at all. Um, but you pull out one weed and like within a day, it feels like three other ones have grown. And it feels like that a little bit in our lives, right? If weeds in our lives are the things that kind of grow around us that make it feel hectic um, or busy um, or tiresome, if those are the weeds, they're kind of everywhere, aren't they? Because life is busy, like period. Whether you have kids or not, life is crazy. There's work and church and friends and family. All those things are there. They're not bad things, but they're always there. And then you have a family. So if you thought your life was weedy, then you add in a, in, in a baby and you are sleep deprived and you are sla a slave to a schedule or a routine. Um, your toilet training and your disciplining and you're running to doctor's appointments and you're visiting in-laws. Um, you're trying to exercise and you're chasing like a work-life balance that people promise but seem impossible. It all feels like weeds. It makes your life feel a little hectic. And then your kids get older. You think it's going to get easier but it gets harder because on top of all those other things um the, the these weeds get more aggressive to be honest you've got sports schedules and arts classes and homework um you've got their social lives and carpooling and behavior in the classrooms um they have part-time jobs and you still have all your schedule right like you're trying to balance that with your own work and your own life and your volunteering and your churching are, are you getting my drift the social calendars all these things your kids get older and then we multiply it by two because we didn't have just one kid, we had two. Or for some of you crazy people out there, you had three and four kids and you went to a zone defense instead of a man to man. And then it must feel even crazier. So the weeds, those things, all the busyness of our lives, despite our best efforts, will always be there. It's complex. There's many different people living many different things and that's okay. There's no shame in it. In fact, um, it's the nature of life. But how do we develop and grow healthy relationships in the midst of these weeds? I actually think Deuteronomy 6 helps us understand how to do it. Um, it was a really pivotal and important time in the life of the Israelites because they had just fled slavery. They were finally free of the Egyptians and all of their customs and ways. Um, they'd been rescued and God had promised his um, like protection and presence with them. And so they were setting up their own community and God was giving them the rules and the guidelines on how to do that, how to love him well, how to love one another well. God was actually explaining and teaching his people how to live 
give um, and how to instruct their children. Like it's actually a word for parents like us. So I'd like us to read that together today. It's from Deuteronomy 6 verses 1 through 9. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. This passage is telling us that parenting is an everyday thing and it's an every stage thing. This passage says that the way that we share the commandments, the way that we parent our kids actually, is to talk to them and to be with them when we're at home and when we're walking and when we're going to bed and when we're on the road, wherever we are. Um, We're supposed to have um, these these values and these words around us. They they should be in our home, even in our hearts, on our our person, in our eyesight. It should be a part of everything that we're doing. It is an everyday thing. It is as we are doing life, as we are in the busy, as we are in the weeds, that we actually uh, parent our kids. It is not only special moments or spiritual places where we teach and parent our kids. You know, birthday parties and vacations, Um, baptisms and rites of passage, they're all great and super important, but they are few and far between compared to the daily packing of lunches and doing laundry. (laughs) Likewise, church services and, and youth conferences and Sunday school classes and prayer meetings are all important, and man, we want them to be a part of our lives, but they only actually serve to enhance our own relationship with Jesus, our daily prayer, our selfless posture, our awareness of Jesus's presence in and around and through us, wherever we go. Special moments and spiritual places are important markers in our lives, and they're great opportunities to like intentionally bless and celebrate, but it is the everyday moments that mark our lives. So embrace the weeds by living an integrated life. You know, many of us can fall into the trap of compartmentalization in our lives and it bleeds into our families. We have like our work life and our church life and our social life and our family life and they're all approached kind of as separate entities. Um, And when we do that, we miss the opportunity to model our values to our kids. We miss the opportunity to know each other deeply and share the immediacy of what we're learning or what Jesus is saying to us or teaching us like when it happens in real time. And so as Ruben and I have looked back on how we have parented, we realize that it has been messy and hectic and weedy and pretty integrated. The first thing is we do a lot of things together. We still do actually. Um, This is most apparent in our church life. So we have never really lived very close to our church until now, like when I, now that we've planted King, but all growing up, we've lived probably 20 minutes to half an hour away from where we go to church, but we've also always served like every week. Um, We launched our church uh, the week after Camille was born. Actually, we're about 19 years old now. And I look at pictures and the week after Camille was born, Reuben was greeting people at that church service, which means Camille 
was greeting at that church service because if one of us went, we had one car, we all went, we were all serving and we have, and it's not just me, you can talk to lots of different people around all of our sites, that we have really um, vibrant mem memories of our kids being a part of everything we were doing here. We missed naps. We drove home in the winter with the windows down completely and the music blasting, trying to keep them awake so they would have a proper nap by the time we got home in the afternoon. And we ate way too many lunches at Ikea. Um, but we did all that. We, we did that together. And it created um, not only like a deep relationship between us, um, a deep ownership of what it is that God has called us to do. Um, it gave us space to know each other well <laughs> and to serve together, to see each other's strengths and weaknesses. And it helped us to make this community, this faith community, their community, not just their parents. But besides doing things together, we actually cultivated a shared, shared interest. It wasn't only at church. Um, we fostered an interest in each other and encouraged us all to support one another. And it started young. Like, we often would watch TV together. We didn't want our kids going into separate spaces, into their bedrooms and on their devices. We wanted to do stuff together. And so we started to try and find TV shows that we all would like. And so honestly, it started with reality television. We watched The Amazing Race and The Voice because we could all enjoy it. And also it was like appropriate. There's lots of inappropriate stuff on television, but we all were interested in it. Um, and then as they got older, we got interested in the stuff they were into. So, you know, we all went to Camille's band performances or as much as possible, we'd all go to Graydon's basketball games. Um, our group chat on, on our phones now is called Team Uric, and we've always used it as a way to kind of support and be involved in each other's lives. Living an integrated life gave us a chance to chat about things as we were walking, as we were sitting together, as we were driving oh so very many places, as we were hauling their friends and talking and laughing together. I also learned to like, like or at least try to like their music, um, although mine's way better. Um, or we listened to podcasts about things that we all were interested in. I wanted them to know, we wanted them to know that we care about the things that they care about. And then finally, living an integrated life meant that we had to be real with one another. This time together gave us and gives us the space to authentically invite Jesus into the everyday messiness of our lives. We can pray before the big test, or we can encourage the fruit of the Spirit in our athlete, or we can uh, speak truth and love over our nervous budding performer. We can volunteer together and serve together and instill the values of service and selflessness and love um, without actually like instruction, like through modeling, through showing it to one another. We didn't have to use our words. Please don't wait for the big, perfect moments in your parenting life. Don't try to unmess your life for your kids. Bring them into it. Show them who Jesus is by sharing how you are experiencing his presence in the mess. Well, parenting isn't just an everyday thing. It's an every stage thing. And besides the weeds, our parenting soil can be shallow too. What do I mean by that? Well, we all want to have an ever deepening relationship with our kids, but many of us feel stuck in this, um, especially when our kids become tweens and teenagers. And sometimes it's because of the weeds, because of the busyness of life. So we're going to try and combat that right through integration. But another way we stunt the growth of our relationships and thus end up in some pretty shallow soil is because we're not moving through the different parenting stages well. Many child psychologists and behaviorists and parenting experts have different language around these different um, stages of parenting, but I'm going to talk about it like this today. Um, there are four major stages. The first is the discipline years, and that's uh, between the ages of zero and five years old. After that, we have the training years. That's for five to 12 year olds. Uh, the third is the coaching years, which is 12 to 18. And the friendship years are 18 plus. These age suggestions are just that, they're suggestions and you have to know your kid and, and all that. But actually in that parenting book I, I referenced earlier by the Stanleys, they mentioned that 
you know, kids are usually always ready to move on to the next parenting stage. It's actually the parents that hold it up. Um, and so, you know, maybe your, your child has some unique circumstances that kind of make them lag a little bit behind. But generally speaking, these are really good suggestions for age ranges for these stages. So let's begin by talking about the discipline stage. Um, that's for zero to five year olds. And the major themes there are that we're teaching our kids that there are consequences to actions. This is for their safety, actually. It's for their well-being and their health you know truthfully their brains aren't developed enough to handle complex scenarios a lot of choices um, they don't they can't grasp really the why they need to do something yet so we shouldn't ask them to we should ask them to learn to trust and obey those that care about them we need to pick non-negotiable things um, for us a lot of those things had to do with like respect and honesty um, and obedience and you have to work that out with your partner as you parent um, but you need to stay focused on those important things um, and not sweat the small stuff so much or otherwise you'll feel like you'll be disciplining all of the time and we need to be consistent as much as possible you know remember discipline is different than punishment sometimes we mix those two up punishment is punitive it really serves no other purpose than to hurt or cost the person being punished. But discipline is different because discipline is correction that trains us, trains a child, trains anyone really. Discipline is correction that trains a child to make better choices. Sometimes discipline will have to result in some punishment. That'll be an aspect of the discipline. But ultimately, discipline is for the betterment of the child. After the discipline stage come the training years. The training years are for five to 12 year olds. And this is, these are the years that we practice all of the qualities we wanna develop and grow in our kids. Um, this includes guys, like you guys who are here as teachers, um, your, your kids at the well volunteers, your aunts and uncles, you get to help us in these training years. Um, we help our kids gain the skills, uh, values that they need to succeed, and we proceed by trial and error. <laughs> we correct and we forgive and we try again. We practice manners, we practice cleanliness, we practice responsibility, we model and teach how to appropriately manage and acknowledge our feelings. We ask our kids to look at us when we speak and we look back because that's how conversations work. Uh, we practice asking questions and responding because we want them to know how to interact with people well. We practice cleaning up dinner and straightening up our rooms. We recognize that our kids will not do in public what they haven't practiced in private. And so we practice and practice and practice. The third stage is the coaching years. This is for 12 to 18 year olds. And I actually think that this is the hardest transition for us as parents. It's at this point in our parenting journey where we loosen the reins a little bit and we allow our kids to put into practice all of that training we've been doing over the last seven years. We begin to focus on connecting over con correcting. <laughs> Andy and Sandra Stanley tell us that it is in these years that we allow our kids to make increasingly independent decisions and we cheer them on. You give them some instruction and suggestions, but you have to hang back a bit, parents, and you have to let them try and gain their own like personal momentum. And like any good coach, sometimes you have to pull the kid out of the game, right? They need rest or some more um, intentional coaching. Uh, but for the most part, we are cultivating constant communication and we are trying desperately not to bail them out. We let them fail sometimes. Oh, that is so hard, right? And there isn't a formula for it. You have to be a student of your kids. You have to know how they organize and communicate and learn and grow. You have to know how God made them, not how you best organize, learn and grow, how they best do that. How did God make them? It's why we have an integrated life. It helps us to know our kids better. And then as a result, we tend to move through the stages a little bit more easily. Oh, and it really helps us when you youth leaders and grandmas and grandpas and family and friends and mentors help us with the coaching. Man, we need you guys. And finally, we end up in the friendship stage. Sometimes it's called the consulting consultant stage. I like friendship better. Um, and that's for our 18 year old and over uh, kids. 
And this is kind of the dream, isn't it? A little bit. We want to be friends with our kids. <laughs> um, at this point, you're not involved in the daily details of your kids' lives. But the hope is, because of all that legwork you've done for the last 18 years, they are inviting you into it. They want to hear your voice. Um, you'll have the opportunity to encourage them, to exhort them, <laughs> to witness them, to enjoy what they're doing. And remember, your voice still carries weight with them. You'll always be their parent. <laughs> a friend too, for sure, but always a parent. And so your words and your reactions, they mean something different to them. And so we need to be careful in this stage. We need to consult and not direct. We need to ask for permission or wait to be invited. So, Maybe these stages seem somewhat intuitive to you, or maybe this is like mind blowing and you're like, oh man, slow down, Melissa. I want to, I want to think about this a little bit more. Um, I do want to challenge you a little bit on it, wherever this is, because some of you are waiting in some pretty shallow soil with your kids. I know we have before, you know, when you skip ahead to a stage too early, um, there are negative results. Your three-year-old, your nine-year-old, your 12-year-old are not your best friends. They don't need you to be their friend. They have lots of friends or they're gonna. They need you to be their parent. They only get one of those. They also don't, like a three-year-old doesn't need a coach. Uh, a 12-year-old doesn't need to get trained anymore. They need to be coached. Do you understand? These are important things. Um, and when we, when, we, um, when we get stuck, when we don't move along those stages, okay, or when, sorry, when we, when we move ahead too quickly, we, um, we tend to put too much weight on our kids that they're not ready to bear. They need us to be their parents. Um, and also, to be fair, we need them to stay our kids because then when they act out or they fail a midterm or they bite the kid at daycare, we won't be personally wounded as well. Like we will be able to see this and, and be able to train and discipline and raise our kids to do better and to make better choices. And then likewise, some of you are stuck in a stage and wondering why your older kids aren't, and you can fill in the blank, why aren't they more focused? Why aren't they more driven? Why aren't they more responsible or independent? The truth is you probably are over-functioning a bit as a parent. And amongst other things, you are unintentionally communicating that you don't believe that they can handle the next stage of their life. Have you thought about that before? We don't have to use our words. Our actions communicate a lot of things. You know, when you manage your kids' calendar fully in high school and I mean like you know when every due date is and every uh, game and every driving lesson or or you're the ones filling out your kids university applications what you are telling them is that you don't believe that they are able to manage their own calendars or their own future or you're telling them that you don't trust them to do it well or you're telling them that it's actually someone else's responsibility to make them successful and I know you don't want to do that. To combat the shallow soil in our lives with our kids, in our relationships with our kids, we need to move through the stages of parenting well, and we need to model deep relationships. You know, ultimately your kids are a part of your family. They are not the center of your family. And one of the ways you can combat shallow soil <clears throat> with your kids is to have rich relationships with, other, with your partner and with other people. You know, while daily integration is important, we talked about that, so is intentional separation. Your kids should not relationally come before your marriage. They shouldn't be your entire social life. When our kids become our friends too early, we lose our friendships with our partners. The best thing you can do, and I'm saying this with love, is to cultivate a healthy love relationship with your partner. When we put our joy and our fun and our social calendar on our kids, we're asking them to play a role they're not meant to. But as we model for them what a healthy adult love relationship or friendship is, we empower them to begin cultivating their own healthy relationships outside of the family. And moms, I mean, I'm a mom, so I'm saying this with love, I get that. We're especially prone to this, to having our identity wrapped up in our kids and we forget that we are friends, we're employees, we are wives, and we are better when we use our gifts and our talents in a variety of ways, not only parenting. So go on dates with your husband. 
even better, go away for the weekend or a week if you can. That's where some of these other people in our community can really help us do that. Go out for coffee with your girlfriends. Go shopping with your mom without your kid. Um, this is another spot where our community can help us do this. Invite us out for coffee. We want to go and we can leave our kids at home sometimes. You know, I've heard many of you say, oh, I can't leave my baby uh, for a night. And your baby is like four because they're not really a baby anymore. Um, let me encourage you. They're going to be fine. In fact, they're going to be great. They will never be cuter than when you've gone away and come back and see them. Truth. Uh, what you will be teaching them without words by leaving them for a while and coming back is that you always come back. They can trust you. They are strong. They are able to be without you for a while. You believe in them. You empower them. Most of us, the time, our actions speak way louder in our, than our words. So we need to show them. Finally, in the quest for a healthy, ever deepening relationship with our kids, we need to know how to combat the, 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 um, the hard soil that can develop um, when there's hurt or unforgiveness or brokenness or trauma. In some ways, it's inevitable, right? We're living with each other all of the time. You know, back to the beginning of their story, when Camille shared with me that she related to Via's experience, I told you how it made me feel. Um, it killed me to think that she felt overlooked and alone. And my heart was broken. If I'm being honest, my first reaction was going to be to defend myself um, and refute everything she was saying and explain how her dad and I had always done our very best um, and that we are like super fair parents and that we are at everything she's ever done. Um, I wanted to defend myself um, and tell her that we were proud of her. I wanted to accuse her of being hurtful and unfair. I had most of that conversation in my head because I didn't say any of those things. I just listened. I knew that in that moment, I could either be someone she could be honest with, someone she could talk to, someone she could tell these things to, or I could be petty and self-protecting and prideful. Honestly, all of this could have really hardened our soil, the soil of our relationship for her and for me. But it didn't. It actually enriched it. Why? Because we love each other. <laughs> we can combat the hard soil in our lives with love. And I don't mean love just like good feelings because at that point I didn't have any good feelings and she probably didn't have any good feelings either. I mean love like the way it is described in scripture. I actually think that love is the key to the rich soil in all of our relationships. And maybe that seems too simple. Like, oh, great, Melissa, the answer is love. Um, my fi your final piece of uh, parenting advice is to love your kids, great. But if that's how you feel, you don't understand the kind of love I'm talking about. The kind of love that is described in 1 Corinthians 13. We hear that passage referred to like a lot of times in, in marriage ceremonies, but uh, um, Eugene Peterson, he, he translated the Bible. It's called The Message. It's just another kind of translation of the Bible that helps us um, understand Scripture in more of our everyday language. And when he writes what love is, man, you understand um, like the depth and the weight and the, the like healing power it has in relationships. I want, I want to read it for you. It says, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others. Love isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, and it doesn't revel when others grovel. Love takes pleasure in the flowering of truth. It puts up with anything and trusts God always. Love always looks for the best. It never looks back, but it keeps going to the end. This kind of love is gritty. <laughs> it's in the trenches. It's a fight until the end kind of love. It's a kind of love that's humble, measured, understanding of others. It believes the best about each other. It forgives and it sacrifices. 
It's the kind of love that God has for us. It's the kind of love we experience uh, from him through Jesus. Jesus taught us that God is our father. Isn't that so amazing? And he loves us like that. He's a father who wants to be a part of our everyday lives, the big moments and the little ones. He wants to be in every stage and challenge that we have. And I believe that as we love our kids like that, however God made you to express it, that our relationship with them will deepen. It'll be rich. It'll be full of joy and truth. And so as we close today, we want to acknowledge that parenting is hard. I get that. We're not always going to get it right. I'm in it with you. And we want to help you with that. You know, if you're interested this winter, we're going to have a learning semester. It's going to be an opportunity for you um, to choose some different, um, I don't want to say courses because it's not like school, but some different topics that you want to de dive into a little bit more deeply. And we're going to have a, actually a parenting uh, um, course for you to take. We're going to go through Andy and Sandra Stanley's um, book and, and subsequent study guide that they've created. Like I said, the, the name of that book is called Parenting, Getting It Right. We're going to be doing that this winter. You can read the book now if you want. You can order it on Amazon or anywhere like that. Um, but this course is a chance for you to connect with other parents and to take some time to intentionally improve your relationship with your kids by developing your parenting skills. But the other way I'd love to help you is to just pray for you. I want to pray for your hearts and your heads to be full and overflowing with this gritty, in the trenches kind of love. The one that is described in 1 Corinthians 13. So whether you are most struggling with, you know, the challenge of living a messy but integrated life or, or maybe moving through the different stages of parenting well, or cultivating deep relationships uh, to model for your kids, I'd love it if I could just pray for you now, um, for you to have a deep, and steadfast kind of love for your kids. Will you pray with me? Oh God, you are love. It's who you are. You can't be anything but loving with us. And you are our father, our parent. You know what it's like to be frustrated or disappointed, exasperated with us, and you love us anyway, and you never leave us. You love us enough to change and mold and parent us. So Father, will you give us that kind of love for our kids? Would you help us to never give up or tap out on them? Would you help us to get to know them and appreciate them and not wish them to be someone other than they are? Would you help us to be humble and give us a posture of learning and selflessness when it comes to our kids so that we don't force our kids to be more than what you've called them to be? Would you make us patient and kind and forgiving? Forgetful when it comes to the ways both our kids and us mess up so that we can be forgiving and have deep relationships with one another. Would you give us eyes to see the ways we can integrate our lives naturally and authentically, putting up with activities and interests that maybe aren't our first choice, but show our kids just how much they mean to us? And would you help us to believe the best about each other and give each other the benefit of the doubt? Protect us from wishing away the age and stage that we are in and instead revel in the gift of each child and where they're at now, knowing that life is short and these moments are gifts. God, we want to love like you do. So would your presence with us and your delight in us be so real that your love can't help but overflow to the people in our family? Thank you that your love keeps going until the end. So will you give us the energy and stamina and ability to parent and love our kids well until the very end as well. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen.